Hi folks, my name is Sarah Vitale. We're a couple minutes late because I just went live on the incorrect page. Um, but with Brandon Absher, I coordinate the Radical Philosophy Association's new series, The Radical Philosophy Hour. You can see past videos on our, the Radical Philosophy Association's Facebook page. Um, tonight's presenters are Ben Curtis, who will be a visiting assistant professor of interdisciplinary humanities at Rhodes College in the fall, and Reese Faust, PhD candidate at the University of Memphis. Um, Ben's paper is titled Reconstructing the Party Form, and Reese's paper is titled What Can Heidegger Teach Us About Human Rights? We will hear from both speakers, and following that, we'll have time for discussion. However, please feel free to put questions or comments in the comment section of the video as they come to you. All right, Ben, thank you. Great. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Sarah. Um, yeah, thank you for this opportunity. Um, to speak and and to share uh, some of my some of my research with with all of you. So thanks to you and thanks to the um, Radical Philosophical Association. Um, the talk that I'm going to give. Let me pull up uh, pull up uh, my slides here. Okay. Um, so the uh, what I'll be talking to you guys today about um, is some of uh, research that I've been doing um, uh, connected to my dissertation and some of the stuff that I've been doing afterwards. Um, uh, I've been kind of interested in uh, looking at different forms of, of group agency and collective intentionality, um, both uh, within, the, within the Marxist tradition um, uh, but also in uh, the analytic tradition, um, kind of more broadly, more more contemporary work. So, um, uh, uh, this is this is part of um, uh, some stuff that I was I was interested in uh, with respect to uh, uh, primarily to to Jody Dean's work, um, uh, but um, this idea of uh, uh, trying to um, uh, bring back some discussion about um, the party and the party form, what the party form can do, um, what it is and what it can do for us. Um, so hopefully, so today I'm going to, I'm going to talk a little bit about that um, and, and hopefully uh, uh, motivate, um, uh, motivate some claims that, um, uh, 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 that will kind of bring back um, an, uh, a renewed interest in, in the, the concept of the party. Uh, so let me my uh, share. Let's see. Okay. So, uh, so uh, what I'm going to talk to you today, mainly or kind of primarily, I will uh, talk about in three stages. Um, at first, I'm going to talk a little bit about um, what Marx and Engels have to say. Um, obviously, the, the the Communist Manifesto is um, a kind of a central and important document for thinking about the party and the party forum. I'm going to go over a little bit about um, a few things that they say there. Um, next, I'll 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 dive into um, some of Jody Dean's work, primarily from her book um, Crowds and Party, um, where she motivates. Um, she gives some, um, um, I think, some convincing arguments uh, for motivating a, a renewed interest in the party form. And then finally, I'll end um, my talk today talking a little bit about the United Campus Workers or UCW, um, which is a, um, it's a wall-to-wall -wall union um, uh, for, uh, for, campus, for campus employees um, that uh, I've done some work with um, in the past. And so I'm gonna talk a little bit about them um, and the, the kind of overarching argument that I'm going to try to make um, in these uh, during this presentation is that uh, we should kind of broaden or, or open up our um, conception of the party uh, beyond what we might normally think of as um, a kind of traditional political party that's primarily interested in electoral or um, parliamentary and po politics, um, but that the party form itself um, excuse me, is a much more, a much wider um, uh, uh, and uh, ultimately more useful concept that can be used uh, in, in other ways. So uh, ultimately, uh, my argument here is that uh, uh, a member-led union like UCW is actually a really good candidate 
um, to be understood uh, as a as uh, as kind of participating in this party form um, in the way that uh, that that both Marx and Engels and uh, Dean describe. So that's the kind of the overview. Uh, so we'll get we'll get on here. Um, so uh, it's interestingly, uh, I think, um, in the manifesto, um, Marx and Engels don't necessarily focus primarily on the the electoral aspects um, of the Communist Party. Um, uh, uh, so I have I have a um, I have a quote here. Uh, the co the Communists do not form a separate party opposed to other working class parties. Um, they have no interests separate and apart from those of the proletariat as a whole. Um, and they don't set up any sectarian principles of their own by which to shape and mold the proletarian movement. So this is, I think, an important um, uh, uh, understanding of the role of, of, of what the party can be is that it's not about setting up something kind of over and against or separate from uh, the working class movement. Um, even, even here, I think we can see that uh, Marx and Engels are um, interested in um, thinking about politics, not just um, in a simple kind of elect electory or, or parliamentarian um, way, uh, but thinking about this in a, in a kind of a broader and a deeper um, uh, fashion, All right? So this, this is what I take to be kind of the central claim um, of what the party should be doing according to Marx and Engels. They say that the immediate aim of the communists is the same of that of all other proletarian parties, right? It's these three, these three aims, right? One, the formation of the proletariat into a class, right? Two, the overthrow of the bourgeois supremacy, and three, conquest of political power by the proletariat, right? And so here we see this isn't. Um, I, I take this not to mean um, that uh, uh, the idea here is to set up some. Um, Kind of electoral party that can be kind of separate from all of the other parties, but really what the what the Communist Party is then um, is something that uh, 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 unites and and is is, a, is becomes an, a kind of overarching um, principle um, uh, 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 under which these other parties um, can can look to for for guidance. Um, uh, Right, Marx and Engels say that that the communist supposed the communist party is supposed to be the most advanced um, uh, in the, in this in this way. Right, so so the idea then is not um, uh, uh, you know push for this or that particular candidate, but the idea is is um, more generally how is the movement supported and what can kind of institutional organizations do in order to further that um, those aims and goals. Right. Um, so uh, that's kind of w what I wanted to say is, is, is um, kind of uh, mentioned that here, even in the Communist Manifesto, um, uh, uh, there's, there's much less, uh, Marx and Engels have much less to say about the, the um, uh, kind of particular organizing, um, like the details of how that organizing ought to happen. Um, and they're, they're speaking more about these kind of broad principles. Um, uh, so I'm going to move on to, uh, to talk a little bit about the way that Jody Dean looks at the party. Um, just kind of quickly, I do want to mention that um, there's, there's quite a bit of, uh, there's quite a bit of other scholarship, um, some really important um, folks who are working on uh, uh, some of these questions. There's a really important debate between um, some letters that were exchanged between uh, Lenin and Luxembourg, for example, um, about the specific, the way in which the specific party form um, uh, ought to be actualized in Germany, in Russia. Um, uh, uh, there's some really important stuff um, uh, by Bernstein as well. Um, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna kind of leave. I only have a, a little bit of time, so I'm gonna leave some of those uh, those things aside. If you're interested, uh, if you're interested in that history. Um, uh, Lukash also, Georg Lukash also has some really interesting stuff to say um, about the party form and about the the way in which um, the party can be a, a vehicle for proletarian class consciousness 
Um, this is, I think, a really interesting and important question um, that I'd be happy to, to um, take questions about um, in the Q&A if, if folks are interested. But uh, for this, uh, I want to get into um, kind of two, there's two things um, about the party form that, uh, that Dean, some, some arguments that Dean makes, um, and I want to get into them um, uh, quickly here. So uh, in, uh, in Dean's 2018 book, uh, Crowds and Party, um, uh, she develops an account of the party that goes beyond this kind of traditional model of, of electoral politics. Um, and there's this quote, I think, really encapsulates what, what she's talking about here. She says that uh, this is the role of the party, um, concentrating and directing the energies of the people. The party shapes and intensifies the people's practical struggles. Um, and, and so this, this then, um, one, one kind of important way uh, uh, that I, I want to follow uh, this argument that Dean's making is that um, the party is a kind of an institutional organization that is at the same time shaping and being shaped by um, the people or by um, uh, 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 the kind of the, the general the general mass masses um, and that uh, uh, oftentimes uh, uh, the criticisms oftentimes the criticisms of the party is that um, the party is supposed to be this kind of top-down um, disciplinarian um, structure uh, that only goes kind of from the leaders uh, to to the rank and file um, and one of the things that, that, that Dean mentions, and this is certainly within, I think, um, a kind of a Leninist, um, a, a Leninist um, theoretical model, is that um, uh, uh, the party is not supposed to merely or simply direct um, uh, 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 these energies, but is also ought to be responsive um, to them as well. So the, the idea here is that the party is an organization um, uh, Again, whose uh, whose task then is um, to to be a site where those energies, those kind of uh, perhaps spontaneous uh, or otherwise generated um, political movements or um, uh, 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 motion, is able to be um, kind of harnessed and uh, uh, and and intensified. All right. So there's there's kind of two. Again, there are two. Uh, um, there are two parts, two aspects of the party. Um, of course, Dean, this is this is certainly not an exhaustive list. Um, uh, there's a lot. Uh, Dean's Dean's account is is um, I think really rich and, and nuanced. Um, but I'm going to focus on on kind of two aspects of the party um, that I think are important and that uh, really lend themselves to kind of they lend themselves to this more expanded notion of the party form that is that is able to encapsulate uh, more than just uh, the kind of traditional um, uh, uh, parliamentarian form of, of the party. Um, so the first one here, uh, Dean writes, more than a body focused on the state, the party is a form for the expression and direction of political will. Um, so this is this is kind of capturing that idea that um, that this this is an institution that is able to kind of maintain and direct um, that political force or that political energy um, in a way that's ultimately going to be more beneficial or or able to make um, kind of a, a, a more real uh, uh, lasting political change. Um, and again, here it's it's clear that um, uh, Dean is thinking about this more than just um, kind of simply a uh, 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 an organization that is trying to win uh, elections. I mean, this might be part of um, part of what the party is trying to do, but it doesn't exhaust um, it doesn't exhaust uh, uh, those 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 uh, kinds of tasks, right? So so there's that, and then the second one um, is this is uh, uh, a kind of missing affective dimension. So Dean writes, missing is the affective dimension of the party. Um, it knots together unconscious process across a differential field to in enable a communist political subjectivity, right? So this is this is where um, uh, Dean wants to move kind of away from just uh, 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 like certain kinds of political change or reform, 
um, but that the party can also be a, a kind of affective space um, where um, uh, where people who are who are kind of fellow travelers in the in the political movement are able to um, come together and um, uh, 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 be able to share share their their joys and their sorrows of the of their political movement, but also be able to support each other um, uh, kind of not only in their political um, uh, these kind of political uh, aims, but also um, to, to kind of uh, uh, um, support each other um, uh, in, in, in that way. So, so here, here are two kind of aspects or dimensions um, that to me point to uh, thinking about the party form as uh, not in this kind of uh, traditional or narrow sense, but that, that um, uh, widening it to include other organizations than just say the Democratic Party or the Republican Party, um, but that we ought to think uh, about other kinds of organizations as being able to do this kind of work, right? So if we can if we can find those organizations that already exist in our society today, um, that uh, 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 that there there may not need there may not be the need to um, I don't know, kind of revive the um, uh, the the kind of old or traditional concepts of the party um, uh, as they were. Uh, um, uh, as they played out um, in the 20th century, um, but that there are new and different um, ways that we can think about um, organizations fulfilling these kinds of roles. So um, uh, finally, I'm gonna talk a little bit about uh, uh, the United Campus Workers, um, UCW, that um, uh, uh, in my view, uh, they're able to, or they, they have and continue to um, kind of fulfill these functions, to play these roles um, that 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 Dean says uh, come from the party form, um, uh, and I'll talk a little bit about about them. And um, I I know some of this stuff from uh, some of this from uh, from personal experience. Um, I got I was luck, luck, lucky enough to uh, spend some time uh, working with the the wonderful folks at um, UCW. So uh, uh, first of all, there's so uh, the United Campus Workers is um, it's technically a local chapter of uh, CWA, the Communications Workers of America. Um, uh, there are um, over over uh, 2,000 members across the state of Tennessee um, on over 20 campuses. Um, there are also um, there are chapters being opened in um, I know at least in in Mississippi and in Georgia and I think in some other places uh, too. Um, one of the interesting things, uh, one thing that I should say about um, the United Campus Workers is that um, because Tennessee is a right to work state, um, uh, we can't um, uh, we can't we can't engage in any kind of collective bargaining. Um, so so this is a union kind of in, in in a certain sense in name only. It doesn't it isn't a, an organization capable of fulfilling most of the traditional. Uh, the, the kind of traditional roles that a union would usually play, um, uh, uh, like collective bargaining, um, but but it is it is able to be a site of a kind of a site of resistance um, to uh, uh, to and, and a, a place kind of from which from which to fight for um, some of these some of these um, political goals. So one of the other things that I want to say that's really cool about um, UCW is that it's a completely member. Um, led union. Um, that means that uh, uh, all of the leadership comes from its membership base. Um, there's an e-board. Uh, there are, are two or three now, I think, um, paid positions, organizer positions, but the, the brunt, the, the, the large majority of the work that's done in, in, in UCW is done by members. Um, and those member, that membership, uh, uh, the other thing that I, that I think is really interesting about UCW is that um, uh, unlike um, some other unions like staff unions or faculty unions that only um, kind of are interested in the interests of uh, one particular group um, of workers on campus, um, UCW is a wall-to-wall -wall camp uh, is a wall-to-wall -wall union, um, which means that uh, anyone who draws a paycheck from the university is um, is eligible for membership. So I think that there's something to be said about that kind of um, uh, solidarity between staff and 
uh, uh, you know, the physical plant folks and graduate students um, and anyone, anyone else who, who happens to be um, uh, drawing, a, drawing a, a paycheck from, from the university. So uh, I think I'm running a little bit, yeah, um, kind of coming up to the end of my time here. So I'm not going to read through this, but this is kind of the mission statement from UCW, um, stuff that they're, that they're working on. Um, I wanted to talk um, kind of in, uh, with, res with respect to um, uh, Jody Dean's first point about the party form, um, that it's able to kind of direct political will. Um, uh, one of, I think, the most successful campaigns that um, UCW had was the Tennessee is not for sale campaign, which started in 2015. Um, then Governor Haslam uh, uh, attempted to uh, uh, kind of institute um, a certain form of outsourcing um, for the physical plant and janitorial staff. Um, uh, that same year, UCW launched um, uh, this campaign and by uh, uh, two years later, um, the governor had abandoned this, um, this attempt to outsource. So um, uh, uh, it's, it's, it's a really incredible story, um, uh, David and Goliath kind of story where, where UCW really didn't have the kind of resources to fight this fight, but because of um, because of uh, kind of dedication, dedicated membership, um, they were able to mount this this extremely effective campaign um, against against outsourcing. So in that in that sense, I think um, UCW certainly uh, fulfills that role of being a being a site that can help direct um, this kind of political will. There was a lot of um, a lot of pushback against this um, uh, uh, this outsourcing campaign. Um, uh, or this outsourcing plan, um, and and UCW was able to be the catalyst um, and direct that um, was able to direct that um, uh, that energy. So uh, there's that, and then uh, oops, uh, uh, the the affective dimension. I mean, I you know I could tell stories of the friends that I've made and the support that I've gotten. I think um, uh, I'm I'm really lucky to have done. Some organizing with them as a, when I was a graduate student at the University of Memphis, um, we tried to we tried to, to organize for healthcare. Um, the graduate students at, at the University of Memphis don't have healthcare, um, and uh, uh, I've been working working on that. Um, recently, um, the uh, uh, there was a a, a push for um, for uh, fifteen dollars an hour. Uh, minimum wage at uh, at the University of Memphis campus, um, and that recently passed. So um, uh, this is a, really a wonderful group of a wonderful group of people um, who I think uh, are are kind of hold each other to high standards and um, uh, 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 part of part of what this space is um, is one in which we support each other in 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 these. Um, these kinds of political movements. So, uh, I'm I'm in there somewhere. I don't remember where where my face is, but maybe you can see it. So, um, so yeah. So uh, yeah. So um, that's what that's that's basically what I wanted to say. Um, um, I think that there are lots of there are other. This is just one example. I think there are lots of other um, organizations today that are doing uh, this kind of revolutionary party work. Um, and so um, I would encourage all of us to to look for those spaces where this is already happening and um, uh, kind of contribute in the ways that you think you can. So thank you so much. And uh, yeah, I'll turn it over to Reese. Thank you, Ben. Um, Reese's presentation, if you have any questions for Ben, um, we have a couple in the chat already, but if any other questions for Ben, um, please just put them in the comment section. Now we're going to move on to Reese's paper, What Can Heidegger Teach Us About Human Rights? Thanks, Sarah. I appreciate that. Uh, I, I would be remiss, however, to say that a good friend of mine and Ben's, uh, when he heard the title of my, uh, of my talk, his initial response was just nothing. 
Um, so the um, there it is a topic that I think though is worth bringing up, however, because I think and uh, we've already gotten a pre comment about this in terms of uh, the uh, uses and abuses of Heidegger's thought. But I do think that there is uh, something that can be useful that can be drawn from it and not the least of which is because Heidegger was such a penetrating and profound thinker that has had an influence far beyond um, what the man himself erred on and uh, was complicit with. Um, so really, I want to start out by sort of getting to the first question of why I'm doing this project. So um, for me, I think the first question is just seeing the state of the world as it is, where we live in a world where uh, we have a single reality principle, one that prioritizes whichever form of capitalist political economy best meets the short-term needs of the economy's beneficiaries. And currently, that reality principle operates under the paradigm of globalized neoliberalism. Um, this works uh, under analyses that have been given by Wendy Brown, David Harvey, Harvey uh, Quinn Slobodian, amongst many, many others. Um, but additionally, prevailing normative rights, normative discourse within international law is built around human rights, rights that one possesses solely on the basis of being human. And for this reason, the legal historian Samuel Moyne refers to contemporary human rights paradigm as the last utopia. However, as he also concedes in his most recent book, human rights are simply not enough under cosmopolitan neoliberalism, in part due to the radical inequities that are allowed to result from it. So really what I want to do is I want to do this project in order to sort of salvage the idea of human rights and the way that rights still persist in our normative language. And it's really not due to, I think, to their independent existence or to some sort of ultimate truth associated with them. But I think because there still is significant normative weight that is afforded to those deemed to possess them. And taking this analysis from D Derek Darby's uh, wonderful book on race rights and recognition. So what I want to say, however, is that a radical break with this prevailing logic is needed, but any plausible replacement must still claim to accomplish the work that rights broadly seek to accomplish as well. And so this is where I'm going to turn to Heidegger because Heidegger opens up avenues for thinking ethics and ontology wrapped in with each other. But this is going to be a bit more of an attenuated version of Heidegger as supplemented by successive work by Jean-Luc Nancy. So of course, Heidegger is seen as the premier theorist of ontology within the continental European tradition. Being in time inaugurates his investigation into the historical alienation of philosophy from being. And he claims that the 2,500 year history of Western metaphysics is in fact the history of the forgetting of being which distorts our ontological accounts. Now, while being in time attempted to break out of this received framework of metaphysics, Heidegger was unsatisfied with his conclusions here. He became convinced that his project remained too beholden to metaphysics, and so he shifted his focus away toward an ontology of the event. So this chat that I'm giving today is going to focus mainly on the development of this more prior primordial form of being, which he writes out uh, in German the, for being Sein, uh, S-E-Y-N, and is often translated in the English scholarship as being B-E-Y-N-G. It's a more archaic form of it. Um, I don't have strong opinions about it but a lot of my talk is now going to follow the work of a colleague of mine here at Memphis, uh, James Bayo, who, uh, Bajo, sorry, uh, what he presents in his 2020 book, Heidegger's Ontology of Events, uh, which is really lovely. I highly recommend that uh, people get a copy. Uh, but in any case, he details what he calls a, a conceptual evolution in Heidegger's thought that begins in being in time with the methodology he calls diagenic analysis. 
Now, what he does is he examines how the role of the concept in Heidegger's ontology and in the methodological evolution of it in order to clarify his ontology by clarifying specifically the relations between grounding and grounded terms within it. Now, he points to this because if one term is grounded by another, which is in turn grounded by another, this chain is a diagenic axis along which Bio claims that Heidegger's work undergoes as it develops regarding the event. Now, pursuing this analysis, he argues that Heidegger's ontology of difference is built around a concept of originary difference at the ontological level, the ground that enables the difference between being and beings to arise. So in other words, what he's giving is the form of the distinction between being writ large and individual beings that was presupposed in being in time, but is now he's trying to figure out the uh, grounding of that. So this is the central operation of being as event that Heidegger is trying to get at. So in trying to get this, there, there's a sense of the event in Heidegger's work that has a historical sense, which is what he's trying to get at with the fundamental rupture in the history of metaphysics. Now, this fundamental rupture has the possibility to generate another beginning, a radically different framework for the intellectual and practical lives of human beings. However, this historical will have a sort of methodological priority in that this is something that we can sort of get to in our sense of being in the world. However, there's also going to be an ontological dimension, which will have to do with the ontological constitution and transformation of history. So in this sense, the more properly ontological sense, event names a dynamic process motivated by a structural instability at its heart. This gives the event a genetic power that is observed within the historical sense. So as, as Bayo puts it, being as event is a differentiation of pure difference from itself, which originates a logic of determinateness and an abyss of difference that exceeds that determinateness. And what this is important to, for is that it gives us a productive logic of ground laying, which establishes the tools for some sort of non-alienated conception of the domain of history, as we see within the historical event. So what he's really trying to get at here, if being as event has this self-differentiating aspect, then that is the ground that is also grounding itself. There's nothing more that comes from it aside from this articulation of this particular grounding. So I told you that story so I can tell you this one. I want to also extend what Bayo is doing here and with the work of Jean-Luc Nancy. Now, what Nancy tries to do is to rethink Heidegger's fundamental ontology by emphasizing the relationality of Dasein, focusing on the with of being with or mit sein. Now, for Nancy, the notion of in common, irreducible to, uh, but yet inseparable from the impossibility of community, rejects ideas of groundedness in either plurality or singularity. The common, having in common or being in common, excludes inner unity, substance, and presence in and for itself. Being with, being together, and even being united are precisely not a matter of being one. Now, Christopher Watkins has described Nazi's challenge in this regard as follows. It is to think the we in a way that resolves neither to the one nor to the I. In other words, to think we otherwise than in terms of the mutually compounding dyad of globalization and fundamentalism. It is the search for a notion of the in common that does not become a body of identity, an us in opposition to a them. So what this then gets us to is rethinking how fundamental ontology can be an originary ethics, as I claimed earlier. So Nancy sees being as put into play amongst us. It doesn't have any other meaning except as this in between, the spacing that occurs in between each of us as singularities. He describes this ontological picture as being singular plural. He writes, being is singularly plural and plurally singular, yet this in itself does not constitute a particular predication of being, as if being is or has a certain number of attributes, one of which is that of being singular plural. However double, contradictory, or chiasmatic this may be, 
On the contrary, the singular plural constitutes the essence of being, a constitution that undoes or dislocates every single substantial essence of being itself. This is not just a way of speaking because there is no prior substance that would be dissolved. Being does not pre-exist at singular plural. To be more precise, being absolutely does not pre-exist. Nothing pre-exists, only what exists, exists. So for Nancy, what Heidegger referred to in his project of fundamental ontology, that is the project that he pursued from being in time toward his later work on being as event, is the claim that there is an originary ethics at the heart of fundamental ontology. Nancy claims ethics is what is fundamental about fundamental ontology. And taking this in light of what has been said about the event or being as event, what I'm trying to say is that with human rights, we have this sort of two-sided event that occurred with the promulgation of human rights law in the international discourse in 1948. So what happens is that we shouldn't see this singular event that occurred in 1948 as exhausting the entire idea of what it means to have rights or to be together. Rather, it's going to be this process in which we're trying to understand what is the human. So although various rights traditions extend back to the early modern period, the notion of human rights that one possesses simply by being human was only codified in 1948 with the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. Now, Czech jurist Karol Vasek proposed a model of human rights built on three generations that prioritize certain related groups. The first generation of civil and political liberties, negative freedoms like free speech, Second generation, social and economic rights, such as the right to welfare or to have a job. And then the third generation, which was part of the reason Vesek was attempting to promulgate this idea, were the group and collective rights. Now, the reason that I started thinking about this in terms of being as an event and as an originary ethics that are tied in with that is that there was a recent analysis that showed that there's no longer a priority of the civil and political rights. Instead, it's more going to be these classic divisions have been unable to trace other developments within the human rights literature. So what it implies is that a fundamental break with prevailing human rights discourses needs to occur. In other words, a new ontology of human rights broadly is needed. So to bring this all together, what I'm suggesting is that if we see the being of human rights or however you wanna think of it, an ontology of human events as this event of self-grounding the human, I think that reading Heidegger through non C in this regard is a way for us to understand our being together, our being singular plurality as a way of thinking that we are the measure, mismeasure and the measure of how our obligations to each other work and how rights operate. And in this sense, I think that recognizing the singularity that we each possess, that we only can have in relation to any plurality that we build off of that contributes to a notion of human dignity. Nancy writes to of the surprise of the event. And as our French speakers might recognize, that with the surprise of the event, we also get the surprise, the overtakenness of the event. And in this sense, this is why Nancy says that each of us is a stranger in this regard. There is a strangeness to each of us that cannot be comprehended, except in such as we are all strange to each other, being strangers together, but not in anything more than this being together can imply. So this is where I'm going to uh, sort of stop and let us uh, ponder this, but I uh, hope I've made at least a somewhat plausible case that we uh, shouldn't uh, completely uh, throw out uh, Heidegger. So thank you for the time. Thanks, Reese. Um, I, I think that I'll start 
um, with you with the question that we have from Rich. So you mentioned that we had a, a question ahead of time. And in, in some way, your paper is um, an engagement with this question entirely, right? You're, um, you're suggesting um, why we should be rereading Heidegger. But of course, you know, one could go to Marx's on the Jewish question for a different type of analysis of rights, and you're choosing to go to Heidegger. Now, um, Rich's question is for those who don't see it on the event page. Um, I would like to ask how Mr. Faust accounts for Heidegger's Nazi party membership and his lifelong refusal to recant even after repeated requests from Arendt and Marcuse. Doesn't that indicate that Heidegger remained a reactionary fascist thinker to the end? Why keep trying to use such work? And then, and then, and what does such use suggest about the thought of those who use it? Um, I can vouch for Reese, he's a good one, um, but um, just reading the question in its entirety there. So uh, how would you like to respond to this? Uh, thank you for uh, saying that I'm a good fascist. Uh, no, I'm kidding. Thank you, Sarah. Um, I think, um, you know, there, there is a way in which some of this criticism of Heidegger, the man, is almost missing the point. But I think about this in terms of the history of Western thought generally. We all know to some degree that the people we generally read are not the best in terms of who they were and not in the sense of, oh, well, you know, by these uh, nice bourgeois liberal standards of 21st century, we can say that it was very wrong for someone to have these racist opinions, but in the sense of what does this have to do with their thought? So there is a convincing case to be made for Kant that because of the role of the anthropology, uh, as a necessary supplement to what's going on with the categorical imperative. Yeah, there are some legitimate critiques about the racism involved within his method. One of Ben and I's uh, uh, former colleagues has written quite uh, convincingly in this regard. Um, and of course, with Heidegger too, this isn't quite the same either, is that with Heidegger, he always, he does have this problem of tying, at least in his early ontological work, of tying it to place. There are very Volkish adjacent aspects to his proper philosophical thought or philosophical thought proper. And there is certain, there are, there's plenty of evidence that Heidegger did try to adjust his project for the ideology of the Third Reich. Um, that said, I think that the corpus of the author goes beyond uh, the body or even the corpse of the author as well. Um, and But at the same time, I think there's also an obligation that comes to engage with the thought responsibly and not to just dismiss it as bad faith criticism. So to do my due diligence in this regard, um, Yes, uh, Heidegger's Nazism, Con detestable, condemn it. It should be condemned, good, uh, it's terrible. He should have said something, he really should have. But at the same time, this particular aspect of his work that I'm engaging with is divorced from it. And I would also argue that my use of Nancy is an attempt to also surpass and overcome whatever lingering aspects there could be for the particular vectors within his thought that might lead to fascism. So Thanks, I hope that's a fair answer. And I know that there are Heidegger people watching, so I hope I did justice in that regard. Yeah, it's a good answer. And um, Lila Mo, one of the, um, the commenters here said, as Arnold Farr puts it, we have to do hazmat philosophy. Put on your suit, get into the theory, get what you need and get out. I love it. Um, that's beautiful. That's, that's a perfect Farrism. I love it. Um, so Ben, we're going to put a question to you here. Um, this is from Brandon Absher. 
why choose the party form traditionally associated with communist, socialist, and labor parties on the left rather than the union itself as a form of workers' organization? After all, there's a long tradition of anarcho-syndicalism that would criticize the party as too bureaucratic, hierarchical, professionalized, and focused on taking state power. Yeah, so this is this is this is a great question. Um, and yeah, Reese, I love the like overcoming the Heidegger that remains, right? That's the that's the goal. Um, but no, this question, this question about about um, kind of union power versus versus party power. Um, uh, I mean, I, I would hope I would hope that this doesn't have to be an either or question. This can be a both and question in terms of the way in which we organize. Um, I'm I can give you the I can give you the kind of standard Leninist response, um, which comes kind of out of um, uh, uh, what is to be done, right? That says that um uh the that the the union um the union as a side of kind of economic uh class struggle doesn't quite reach the kind of universal level that the that the political struggle um uh requires so one of the reasons um why we might think that we need a party form is uh in in one sense to be able to unify parts of the um parts of the society or the people um who uh uh, who might not otherwise be um, uh, uh, kind of taken in by the by the labor movement. I think that um, uh, uh, we can certainly see this uh, if we want to look at some of the particular um, kind of the 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 particularities, say in the United States in the 20th century, um, uh, 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 certain forms of um, uh, uh, barring entry um, for certain oppressed groups of people, namely African Americans, right? Um, uh, that, that there's, I think, uh, perhaps, um, uh, uh, at least from the kind of Leninist perspective, um, I think uh, this idea that um, uh, the economic struggle needs to be elevated um, uh, uh, in, a, in, a, in order to, uh, to, to, to be universal, universalist in scope, um, I, I would say is kind of the, the, the Leninist answer. Um, I mean, my, my, speak a little bit more personally, um, I, uh, again, I would say I wouldn't want to oppose the party form to the union form. I think that in a lot of ways, they're trying to do different things. And so insofar as they have different um, explicit aims, that it's it's useful to have different uh, organizational structures. Um, but that being said, you know, if we want to look at union power or, you know, kind of uh, mass organizing power on the left today, um, at least in the United States, um, uh, uh, I don't think that it, it really reaches the same kind of levels that we saw a hundred years ago, right? Um, you know, if we look at if we look at uh, the you know the October Revolution and the the kind of the aftermath of of um, of some of these socialist democratic socialist movements in the twenties, um, there's a lot more uh, energy that's that's kind of available to use, as it were. Um, and so it, it may very well be that the kind of, you know, that traditionalist kind of party form um, just isn't really viable right now, given our own kind of historical moment, right? Um, uh, it may be that it may very well be that uh, what is needed is a development of in the in the economic class struggle in order to even, I don't know, prepare the people to use kind of Jody Dean's language to kind of prepare the people to even become a political subject, right? Um, uh, uh, and, and maybe that development needs to happen in the economic in the economic sphere. But I think this is a great question. I think this is something that we should uh, certainly um, focus focus our attention on. Um, but yeah, I mean, really, uh, uh, my main kind of answer to that is is why why should we choose? Um, why can't we uh, why can't we do both? Great, thank you, um, Reese. Another question for you here. Um, Brandon talks about in the letter on humanism, where Heidegger criticizes humanism as a framework that's grounded in the Western metaphysical tradition. He seems to reject ethics as such in that work. Does this pose a problem for the attempt to use Heidegger for rethinking human rights? Isn't the human itself not a problem? Uh, thanks, Brandon. I, I do appreciate that. And I should have, uh, I should have engaged with the letter on humanism in this talk. Um, uh, and Ben can attest to this too. I find myself kind of torn between um, an enlightened humanism and total anti-humanism. 
Um, I'm, uh, I'm not now Tusarian um, or a Foucauldian, um, which I don't know what that means for my radical credentials. But uh, what I can say is that I think this question of the human is something that is, as Heidegger rightly points out, something that is uh, historically fraught and is something that requires a um, interrogation um, and a critical one as well. I mentioned Derek Darby's book, uh, Rights, Race, and Recognition, which I got, uh, uh, which I have staring right at me right now. And he makes a compelling case that the measure of rights is specifically the amount of social recognition that one is granted to allow them to engage in their rights and to exercise them. And I think that you see this in a lot of the decolonial thought that is uh, circulating within political theory now as to saying, again, what is the mismeasure of man that has been used in these discourses as well? So I think it's the problem of the, it is certainly a problem, but a problem in the very productive sense of forcing us to be self-critical and self-aware in that regard. Now, I'm thinking with both of your presentations that, um, you know, Reese, you talk about this kind of being singular plural at the end, and you're using Nancy's language of kind of rethinking the individual. And Ben, you're talking about this kind of affective dimension of the party, so the party as a party. <laughs> um, so this kind of this festival, but it involves this kind of communal sense, this solidarity, this rethinking of the individual and the relationship between the individual and the group. Um, and so, you know, I don't I think I have quite a question for this, um, but I wanted to know if either of you wanted to speak a little bit more to, you know, either to this question of the affective dimension, I'm really interested in that. Um, you know, being singular plural sounds like less of a party than, the, than putting the affective party back in, um, you know, the affective dimension back into the party. Um, and then I'm also thinking about like, to what extent, Ben, is that prefigurative? Mm -hmm. And so like, you know, would Dean, are you sign on to any sense of prefigurative politics? Like, are we enacting a kind of future that we want to create? So I don't know, I'm now I'm just rambling of the things that are coming to my head, but if either of you want to pick up on either any of these threads. I, mean, I think that, yeah, uh, Jody Dean, I, I think is, is certainly, um, uh, yeah, using, like trying to use the party space as a, as, yeah, as a way of imagining um, a kind of a different, a different future, right? Um, but I think that there's also, um, I mean, I, this, this question of humanism is one that I've, I've kind of kicked around as well, um, kind of before, before, before doing some of this uh, group agency stuff, um, I, I read a lot of Derrida and was interested in kind of French post uh, uh, post structuralist thought, and 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 I've I've I you know I have a hard time kind of settling in on kind of what what I think about the like the human. Um, I mean, I think it's a to me it's a category that um, even if we want to overcome it, um, we still it still is is operative in our in our world, right? So in in that case, um, you know. Uh, uh, I would say, even if we want to be post-humans, which I think there's some good arguments for why we might want to go beyond the the, the category of, of the human, um, uh, where we are today is certainly not a post-human, um, uh, a kind of a post-human world. And um, uh, those these categories of the human, I think, are still are still really operative. So. Um, you know the you know there's there's a, the the kind of Marxist tradition of the, the humanist Marxists right, um, which I don't always necessarily like that as a as a category. I think in a lot of ways they get kind of all lumped together as like not as like mis they're really the misfits, um, <laughs> uh, the the kind of misfit Marxists. But um, uh, uh, I'm sympathetic to a lot of those um, those arguments. So yeah i guess uh, sort of to uh to sort of see the connections here uh part of the reason i got interested in nancy originally was on his question of community and precisely was in trying to approach how groups form in these very affective senses um and uh i agree being singular plural as uh not a uh, political party or uh even uh 
I mean, in some ways, it's the condition for all parties, but um, that very bare ontological sense aside, um, I would say to that recognizing this constitutive, even intersubjectivity is already too atomistic for what Nancy is trying to get at here. And I think this is this notion of the common without being in common is really what is at stake here. And I think it's precisely in those moments like the fidelity to the party that Dean talks about as well, um, that really gets at how you can form a sense of the common without essentializing it either. So I think this is really where it can come together um, and can respond. Um, I'm a bit more of a German romantic than Ben is in this regard, um, but uh, I, I take that with all of the uh, 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 irrational dangers that come alongside with it. So certainly, certainly the irrational. Um, but I think this, you know, this question of like, what is the relationship of the individual to the group, I think is just a really funda a fundamental question. And um, this is one of the things, again, that I really like about Dean's view is that um, uh, she, she talks about uh, a kind of collective agency that is itself not reducible to the agencies of the individuals, which um, <clears throat> might seem kind of like uh, um, uh, not a very profound statement, depending on on you know what tradition you're coming out of, um, but I think uh, uh, has a lot to inform um, a lot of uh, particularly a lot of uh, contemporary analytic philosophy um, uh, that is I think in a lot of ways stewed in a certain form of liberalism um, that I think uh, uh, I'd like I certainly would like to to move away from. So so trying to understand what this is and to try and again think about. Um, uh, in what ways? In what ways are the group? Is the group um, kind of more? I don't know to use uh, uh, to use Heideggerian language. Like, uh, in what ways are, are the, is the group a more kind of primordial entity um, uh, that then uh, uh, the individual is somehow derivative, right? Um, uh, again, not not one sidedly, but 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 in what ways? In what ways are you know are the individual is the individual determined by um, by some kind of group ontology, right? Some kind of primordial um, uh, ontological status, I think is, uh, um, I think this can, I think that this can help us, right? I think this can help us, um, uh, again, kind of better organize, right? And, 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 and also be more effective um, in the kinds of political campaigns that we engage in. I wanna put um, one more question from the, from the comment section to you. And, and this is a, a amusing by Jeff Nicholas here. Um, he writes, I'm wondering about union constitution as an event and whether each such constitution gives rise to a new set of rights. So um, kind of bringing together your, your papers in, a, in another way here, um, if anybody wants to comment on this. Um, so I'll, I'll say, I think, this is, I think this is really interesting. And I think that this, uh, uh, in order to to really address this, I think I'd I'd have to know bad. I'd feel I'd have to feel a little bit more comfortable um, with uh, uh, with my badju. Um, I, I have to admit um, I've I've picked it up and put it down a couple of times. And so if, if there's anybody watching who wants to help me uh, help me help me learn learn uh, some some badju, and and uh, I think that would really help. But um, uh, uh, I think that there is a, a really interesting way that we could that we yeah, we might want to think about. Yeah, the constitution of a of a union or the constitution of a political party as as an event, right? Um, in that in that kind of Bajuian uh, um, sense. But uh, again, I uh, I'll, I'll I'll kind of keep it there because uh, uh, my my Baju knowledge is restricted, so I don't want to say something uh, silly. I guess um, my uh, contribution to a philosophy of the union event here. Um, will be to simply say that um, one of the reasons that I like this reading of Heidegger that Jim Bao gives, it's very close to Deleuze's account of the event, which I tend to find preferable to uh, Bajou's uh, notion of the event, because 
uh, the Jews, I think, is too algorithmic um, uh, and extremely uh, anti-human, if as it were. And I think that there is more room for agency and human action involved within Deleuze and even this Heideggerian notion of the event as well. So because of this way of understanding, we don't have to have a fidelity to an event that we realized is past, but we can actually reconstruct what the elements would be for new events to occur. And I think that sort of capacity is helpful. And even in this idea of exercising the constitutive power and say a union agreement, a group agreement, dare I say a constitution for a nation state, there is a sense of a new beginning that is created. There's an excellent book by Eric Foner uh, called The Second Founding, which is precisely about the post-Civil War amendments that were passed. So effectively shifting the date of the founding of the contemporary United States, not even 1619, not 1776 or 1787, but 1868 when the last of those amendments passed and ushering in this new paradigm that we're in. So certainly I think that there is an eventual structure to constitutions. And in fact, this is something that has inspired my interest in events and constitutions both. So thanks, Jeffrey. Yeah, and in so and insofar as the event is somehow unique, right? I think, you know, this is this is another thing that I think is important is that, you know, there's there's uh, kind of so much theory that we can do, right? This hazmat, but then when we step out, we have to figure out how to apply whatever lessons we might learn from history or from theory to again, the like real conditions under which we live right um and so uh um you know uh thinking of those of those things as, as events in this in this kind of uh um broadly speaking we'll, we can call it maybe french post-structuralist movement right um uh or Heide the, 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 yeah it's kind of neo-heideggerian or post-heideggerian um uh discussion of the event i think is it's important to think about uh uh the uniqueness of that so that we can be um, as as we're planning our own events, right? As we're looking towards the future, as we're looking towards um, the way in which we might um, uh, be able to engage in these kinds of political action and movement, um, uh, that we recognize the particularities of our own situation, and that we don't just try to reproduce either the you know kind of again, like you said, algorithmically the successes or the failures of the past. It's really important when we're thinking about party, right? Because there's been this big move in the left to be afraid of the notion of party. Um, and it's interesting to me, I'm just thinking about this series that we had Larry Allen Busk, who talked about the importance of the party um, with regard to climate change. And now we have you, Ben, talking about the importance of the party. And so I'm wondering if we're gonna get anybody in this series who's gonna push back on that, or if there's this kind of RPA shift to, but it's too, it's too soon to say something like this, but to, to thinking about, I mean, we had Jody Dean speak a couple of years ago at the conference, um, which was really interesting. So, yeah. And I think that's this is a, a live question for us as we're thinking about organizing in um, in the 21st century, you know, with all sorts of global concerns like climate change, how can we do it fast enough and effective enough to to respond to these crises. Yeah, well, but, Jen, sorry, I was just gonna say yeah Larry's work is awesome. Um, so yeah, big shout out to him too. All right. Um, well, I want to thank you both. We're a little bit over time. I want to thank you both very much for joining us today and for your interesting papers. And this was, um, and thank you all for watching um, and your comments. I encourage both of you to go into the comment section afterwards and, and further engage with folks. And um, tune in next month on August 2nd, which is the first Monday of the month, for Daniel Lewis Weika, um, whose presentation will be George. Uh, Friedman, Marxism, Technological Change, and the Great Equilibrium, and Amy Wendling, um, who will be, her presentation is called Deskilling, Automation, and Alienation. Um, so we have a couple great talks for next month, August 2nd. Please share the word, share the videos, um, and thank you both so much. Yeah, thank you, Sarah.